Good afternoon. We're going to be talking today about how I see the role of fat grafting versus fillers, and I think it's a little bit more intricate than just uh, one being uh, analogous to the other one. For disclosure, uh, my book. This really has changed everything in my practice over the last two years. In the past, I would say fat grafting was the gold standard, the only modality that could allow me to offer patients a beautiful sculpting of the entire face. With the advent of the cannula, I'm really able to sculpt the face with micro precision, and that really gives me even a compliment to my fat grafting results. So for me, what's so important, and, and just like for you, is communicating with a patient. And if you don't communicate well, no matter how good your results are, they may not be able to understand those results. So I use three models I'll be talking about today, which is the face like a, a glass of water, the face like a bed, and then house on sand. And each of those are modalities for me to, to speak with a patient, because I always like to say that an education is what you tell a patient beforehand, and an excuse is what you tell them afterwards. We want to give them educations. So the model that I like to start with is understanding the face like a glass of water that empties. And from a volume perspective, I think this is a very easy analogy to communicate with a prospective patient. So you, you see today, unfortunately, a lot of celebrities that are not, no longer over uh, lifted, but they're overfilled. And so when you ask women in particular, when did you think you liked your face the most? Oftentimes, it's more of the early 30s and early 20s when there's a lot of baby fat. And if you think about what aging is, it's a linear loss of fat from birth to death. A one-year-old, then take a 10-year-old, take a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, etc. It's just ongoing volume loss minus obviously weight gain that can occur with metabolic changes. So the yellow lines that you're seeing here is basically just having the volume restored depending on how old you are. And the pink lines are showing that, you know, is a result permanent? Well, if, yes, the fat graft is permanent once the graft is there because it has blood supply. But over time, you continue to lose volume. You continue to, lose, you continue to age. It doesn't stop the aging process. And that glass of water analogy is a way that I can communicate with the patient that I've filled you up to a certain level, but you'll continue to go down over time. That's normal. So at the how do I sort of communicate with the patient this? I think it's important not to sell fat grafting as this perfect treatment modality that will eliminate tear troughs, make folds perfect, make your cheeks exactly perfect, because it is a graft. It has to have blood supply. And I believe that if you're filling the entire face, fat is such a beautiful treatment because it, it gives you a really ability to cover so much ground at a very low expense. But at the same time, I always tell my patients that they probably will still need a little bit of fillers to make the result as good as possible. So this 80-20 rule is what I like to usually express to my patients. And so how do I decide whether to do fillers or fat? Someone that's younger, I like fillers because if they come in, they just want a tear trough. I think there's variability in, in success when you're just using fat in one discrete area. If you're using globally, I think you actually have greater success because of the fact that it's, it's less expensive when you're doing, instead of doing 15 to 20 syringes of a product, you can get very good results with fat overall. And so this 40-year-old is a very arbitrary thing. I clearly do fillers in 55, 60-year-olds, and I do fat in 35-year-olds. But I don't do fat in people maybe like 20 or 30 that are very, very young. Um, the idea is cost is really, to me, the delineating factor. But what is cost if you break it down? You, you, you think, well, fat is going to cost a certain amount for surgical fees, et cetera. But I look at it th this way. The fillers also cost a lot, and they can cost more than fat grafting if someone needs a lot of volume. Think of that glass of water. If I've got to fill that glass of water up a lot, the, if fat is free, it's a great way to build up that face really easily and then come back and just micro finesse it with fillers. The other thing you don't think about, the balloon is symbolizing swelling and recovery. The fat, yes, you go through one larger recovery of a week or two, but then with fillers, you go through micro recoveries of, of, of multiple sessions. So something that a patient least needs to understand that and weigh those decision points based on both cost and uh, recovery times. So I use two principal products. I don't have financial affiliations with the companies other than I use the products. How do I use it if I'm going to go the filler route? Um, under the eyes, I don't like the tindling effect with uh, Restylane. I prefer Artifil if I can. I like that under that area. Uh, the folds with greater durability, I like something that has better longevity, so I like something more durable. I tend to use Artifil there. 
for areas of the cheek where, you know, with g weight gain and weight loss, you're a little bit more concerned with a lot of volume changes. I like something that can be reversed, something that's not as long lasting, especially in someone younger. I also like it because the hyaluronic acid fillers are less expensive and I can use more volume. It takes more volume to make the changes. In the temples, I actually prefer Restylane over almost any other product in the temple. I dilute it down with point five cc's of saline and I use between one, two or three syringes and it's just, I, I find it to be a better fill than even fat and better than any other product and I've had some problems, I don't know if you guys experienced it but when I'm using, um, I used, I've tried Restylane, I've tried Perlane, I've tried Juvederm, I've tried Artifil diluting and I just can't quite get the same beautiful distribution as Restylane does. I just, it gets all cakey when I'm using Juvederm and Artifil when I, when I dilute it so somehow it just works really well in the temple area. Um, the, so just to break it down very easily, fillers versus fat. Fillers I like in a younger age bracket, fat I like in an older age bracket, and that older is obviously a, a relative term based on biologic aging, etc. And so the reasons for this, oh, you have the older version, I guess. You pull the older version, doesn't matter. Uh, is that the, the uh, younger patient is, the two benefits is that it's actually cheaper for the younger patient if they just got a little bit of aging, you don't need that much volume. And for the older patient, it's cheaper for fat because they need so much more volume placed into their face. And the other thing you have to remember that we always put it in ideas of temporary and permanent fillers, but we also have to understand that, that synthetic fillers are bioinert for the most part, and fat for the most part is bioactive, so it's weight dependent. So it's one of those things that when I'm dealing with a patient that's much younger or unstable weight, I tend to prefer fillers. So the second analogy I'm gonna to use to communicate with a patient so they understand this better is your face is like a bed. And what that means is if you break down the three components of the face, going down from uh, superficial to deep, and for the sake of argument, we'll say the sheets reside above the duvet, the mattress is the fat. Fat is a great treatment, but the only problem with fat is that it's a very, it's a very soft treatment. It's not precise. When I wanna go and fill a discrete area of the face, someone says, can you just knock out this little dent? Can you knock out this wrinkle? Fat is imprecise for that. But it's a beautiful foundation when you fill the whole face deeply, and fat is placed deeply to fill the face. So for me, it's a great mattress fill. It allows me to, to rapidly generate volume and establish the face to be much more youthful. The closer you get to the skin, the less fat succeeds. Will a tear trough be perfect after fat grafting? I say no, it's gonna get you pretty darn close, but it's not gonna get you all the way. Sometimes I do, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I like to consider those small little dents in the cheeks, small little areas, as a place that's really, really good for filler augmentation. And then I talk about the sheets, which is the moving surface where there's photo damage, et cetera. Then you're gonna need some kind of neurotoxin, peels, uh, skin care products, laser treatments, IPLs, et cetera, to manage that. And when you break down this, uh, these layers, it's a great way to communicate to patients so they understand how each modality would work effectively for the face. The final analogy I like to talk about is building a house on sand. What this means is understanding permanent and temporary fillers in the face and how I like to sequence that. So a lot of times we could say, well, you could put some, you know, wrestling in your face and then if you don't like it, it'll, or, or we can dissolve and then go to fat or something. I don't think that's a great viable option because, you know, hyaluronic acid, I'm sorry, hyaluronidase can also dissolve some of your natural tissues. It's unpredictable in large scales. I like hyaluronidase to manage something that doesn't look good, a small bump somewhere. You very discreetly apply it. But if you try to wash it over the face, I think you get unpredictable loss in the face. So I don't like building a house on sand, meaning I don't like to build a permanent structure like fat grafting over someone that's had multiple, multiple uh, fillers in the face with hyaluronic acid, for example, or something of a temporary nature. Um, at the same time, obviously fat on top of fat is not a big deal. It's the same product, so it's not a big deal if you go back and touch up your own work. Um, this, uh, the flip side of this, having the sand on top of the house is okay. In other words, having something temporary structure applied on top of a, a, of a foundation of of permanence to me is okay. I come back all the time and add a little bit of hyaluronic acid to my fat and it works really, really well. Um, I also use permanent fillers and I find that to be even better sometimes when, I, when a patient says, look, 
I've got to now do a temporary on top of something you did permanently. Well, it's nice to just touch up little areas with a permanent filler to, to manage that if you feel comfortable in your hands to do this. And then I rarely do a foundation with permanent fillers and go to fat. And part of the reason is cost. Again, I'm always looking at cost-benefit ratios. And when you build a face with a permanent filler that can be quite expensive over the face, and then you have to charge a patient a surgical fee and then go through fat, I think it's less viable. So if, if someone can't wait to do the fat or they can't afford to do the fat, I may go do a little bit of a tear trough or something and then tell them, look, don't spend any more. Let's go to fat when, when the time is right and then come back and maybe touch up my work with a little bit of permanent filler. So again, this is permanent on top of permanent. I feel comfortable with it, but from an economic standpoint, I don't like this, this order. I like the reverse of fat followed by a permanent filler. So what does this mean in terms of understanding sort of short range, long range thinking and using the idea of high, putting together the house on sand and, and then this glass of water idea? I like to do fat first come back at a year later when the fat uh, tissue is integrated and, and where I've got my result and touch it up with a filler. And then I tell my patients, look, it's every year to two years, you're gonna need a little bit of a touch up down the road because there's further aging. And again, it's so important to articulate that to a patient before you engage in the surgery, not afterwards when they go, they think it's a mistake that they didn't get a good enough result or why did your fat last three years? Well, fat is permanent. You know, and the only difference is you're going to continue to age. You'll lose some over a period of time. So this is a way that I can communicate to a patient effectively. So just going back to those three analogies, I think these are really, for me, been very helpful tools that I can use to communicate with a patient. I believe that communication is everything. And if you can't communicate well to your patients, it doesn't matter how good surgeon you are. It just may be misinterpreted. Uh, so this is an example of a lady at 35 and then 41. This is basically about a mixture of uh, of artifil around the eyes and some rest on the cheeks and some artifil in the cheeks as well and artifil around the folds. And this is uh, 35 to 41, so over a six year period of, of multiple syringes, is quite a few syringes. Uh, this is a lady that you can see is just a fat transfer result at a year. So it's a great result, it's not a perfect result. And then I come back and I just touched her up with a little bit of the uh, wrestle in the temples, a little bit of artifil in the eyes, and it just brushes it up just a little bit more. And if you want to see from beginning till the end, I think it's a nice subtle change that provides a nice rejuvenation. Um, this is a lady here, this is a fat transfer result. You see it about a year, it's a nice result. You know, clearly there's little areas that bother me that are not perfectly blended. And I came back and did that same combination of therapies that just further brightens it up, takes it up another ste step. And then you wanna see from beginning to end, you can see that it's just a nice augmentation when you combine both modalities, at least in my opinion. So I end you with this something I, I said a couple days ago, which is really to encourage you to be artists and to think artistically and not to overfill people, but really be creative in your thinking when you're designing a face. Thank you.